Welcome to our next video in our C-Sharp Basics series. In this video, we'll discuss C-Sharp Flow Control. Here, flow control refers to controlling the path of execution, and our discussion will include if statements, loops, go-to statements, and related language elements. By default, our program will execute each statement one after the other from the first to the last statement. However, this is not very useful for all but the most trivial programs. There are many circumstances where we want different code to execute depending on certain conditions. For example, a program might want to display a notice if an error is detected. Obviously, we would not want to display the same notice otherwise. So let's write a little code here. Um, oops. So this code starts by declaring an integer value called value and it declares a string called s. It then calls readline to get input from the keyboard. After that it calls int.tryParse. Tryparse attempts to take the string and convert it to an integer value. If it's successful it returns true, otherwise it returns false. So here we use an if statement uh, to test the value of triparse. Uh, an if statement will execute the code in the middle of these curly braces if that value is true, otherwise it will not. And so let's uh, print a little message here. And let's run that. Uh, whoops. Um, to prevent the screen from uh, the window from closing that way, we do need to put another read line to keep it open. So let's run that. And I'm going to type one, two, three. And it says got an integer. And let's try it again. And this time I'll put ABC, and we don't get that message uh, got an integer. So the if statement is only executing the following block of code if the condition is true. In this case, we only have a single line, and so we don't need the curly braces. Uh, they're optional. But if you might have multiple lines, then you do need the curly braces all of the lines within the curly braces will be executed if the condition is true. A companion keyword to the if statement is the else keyword. And let's demonstrate that. So as explained, if this condition is true, this block is executed. Now the else keyword will execute another block only if the first block is not executed. So we could say got something other than an integer. And we can run that. And if we type ABC, we get the second block. So when the code's written like this, it'll always be one or the other. Either this one executes or this one will execute. The switch statement works similar to if-else in that it allows you to execute different code depending on a particular value. It's probably a little cleaner for when there are many possible values and for when the amount of code to execute for each value is relatively small. So let's demonstrate the switch statement. We're going to switch on value. And we say case, we can say case one. And then we do a break so that 
the code in the following cases is not executed. And then we can also have this special case called default. And that's kind of like the else. It runs when uh, none of the cases above uh, match. So we can run that. And if I enter one, it says I entered one. And we'll run it again. And I'll enter 50. It says you entered something else. Now obviously in this case, uh, if, if we want to type the number that the user entered, we could just uh, print that number. But I'm just using this to demonstrate how the switch statement works. Sometimes we want to execute the same code, but we want to execute it more than once. For example, if we wanted to print all the numbers from 1 to 50, we could use a for loop. And it would look like this. We say for int i equals 0, or uh, let's say 1. i is less than, less than or equal to 50 and I plus plus. And this is optional again, but I'm going to put it in curly braces. And let's run that. So you can see that it's printed every number from 1 to 50 in a very small amount of code. A for loop first executes the initializer, which is this section here. Uh, you can actually have multiple expressions here, each separated by a comma. No matter how many times the loop's executed, the initializer is always executed exactly once. It then tests the condition section, which is this section here. If the condition evaluates to true, it enters the loop body. Now after the loop executes each time, it executes the increment section here. And again, you can have multiple expressions in the increment section, each separated by a comma. And again, it executes the condition section. If this condition section is true, it once again executes the loop. And it'll re keep repeating that pattern until this condition section evaluates defaults. In this example, I'm simply initializing an integer, incrementing it each time to the loop, and then repeating until the integer reaches a certain value. But a for loop can be much more complicated than that. You can also nest loops. For example, you could have other loops inside the body of this loop. But be sure to use a different variable to track your iterations. For example, if your inner loop changed the value of the i variable, that would affect the number of times the outer loop executes. Another kind of loop is the while loop. Let's try to rewrite this same logic except using a while loop. So a while loop only has the condition section. So if we want to initialize it, our, our loop variable, we have to do that before the loop. And if we want to increment it, we have to do that inside of our loop so that it gets incremented each time through the loop. And let's run that. And we can see that that produces the same result, 1 through 50. A variation of the while loop is the do while loop. A do loop always executes at least once. The while goes at the end. At the top we put a do and then we put a while 
at the end, as I said. So as you can see, it enters the loop, and then it tests the condition at the end of the loop. And we'll run that. And again, we have it printing the numbers 1 through 50. Now, if you want to terminate a loop earlier than normal, you can use the break keyword. The break keyword will execute the current loop. So let's put it here. Let's say if i equals 5, then break. As we learned earlier, the if statement only executes if this condition is true. And so we only hit the break when i equals 5. And let's run that. And we see we print the numbers 1 through 4. When we reach 5, we, bro we break. And we break before the right line statement. And so we never see that 5 or any uh, numbers after that. If you want to exit the body of the loop and then start the loop again, you can use the continue keyword. Continue will go back and restart the loop. So let's say if i equals 11, delete that break statement, let's set i equals 20 and then continue. And let's run that. So here we print the numbers 1 through 10 and then we skip to 20 and continue on to 50. And the way that works is when we reach this point in the loop, when i equals 11, we then set i to 20. And remember, i is being used as to determine what the uh, when the loop terminates and also um, it's the value being printed. So we set it to 20 and then we tell it to continue which means we don't print 11 and we jump up to the top of the loop and we start executing the body again. Now if you use continue in a for loop it will still execute the increment section and it will only actually execute the loop body again if the condition section evaluates to true. Another option is the go-to statement. The go-to statement can be used to jump to any label and begin executing statements from there. We'll just make a, a trivial example of that. Let's say go to my label and then we'll define my label down here. And labels are followed by a colon and we'll execute that. And we see that all of our code is skipped and uh, it doesn't really do anything at all now. So early programmers didn't have the rich collection of functions and loop constructs that we have today. They relied on go to or jump statements to branch execution as needed. And sometimes this produced code that was difficult for other developers to read because it was hard to assess the overall execution flow. Such code was sometimes referred to as spaghetti code because you had many different paths that the flow of execution could take. For this reason, use of the go-to statement is frowned on these days. In fact, some people are downright fanatical about avoiding go-to. This fanaticism is not justified. However, it is rare that a go-to statement cannot be replaced with a more modern construct in a way that makes the code easier to read. And so the use of go-to statements should be minimal. And for those of you who are learning to program, you should avoid go-to statements altogether until you become comfortable using the more modern constructs. So in this video, we got an introduction to C-sharp flow control. We learned about using if-else to conditionally execute blocks of code. We also learned about the switch statement, and we also learned about the various types of C-sharp loops. We also learned about the go-to statement, which works fine but generally is avoided in favor of more modern constructs. Thanks for watching.